Uh, I'm uh, on the board of directors and past president of the 306 Bomb Group Historical Association, and I'm also on the board of directors of the 8th Air Force Historical Society. And it's the mission of these organizations to remember, honor, and educate. To remember the air war over Europe, to honor the men who fought it, and to educate the public about it. And that's what my presentation uh, is all about. It's about 45 minutes in length. There's about 60 different slides, so we go through them real fast. But uh, I think you'll be entertained by uh, the information. Growing up, I knew the basics of my dad's World War II history. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. He was stationed in England with the 8th Air Force. His plane was named the Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. He flew bombing missions over Europe, and in February of 1944, his plane was shot down, and he was missing in action for seven months. But he evaded capture and eventually got back to England. But it wasn't until I retired in 2009 that I had the time to really delve into my dad's history in more detail. My parents had kept a lot of material uh, about from the war years, and I just wanted to go through that and sort through it and learn more details. And there were two items that were really significant. One was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action that's absolutely riveting, so much so that it was written and in, uh, included in two books that were written. On the left is the 98th by Gerald Astor. It was about the 8th Air Force who flew high altitude or uh, daylight precision bombing missions. Uh, the goal was to hit military and industrial targets uh, to cripple Germany's ability to wage war. Their first mission was on August 17th of 1942 when 12 planes from the 97th Bombing Group hit uh, Rhone, France. The other book is First Over Germany by Russell Strong. It was about the 306 bomb group that my dad was in. Russell Strong was a navigator in the 306 and became his historian uh, after the war. Uh, the 306 motto was first over Germany because it was the first bomb group to hit a target in Germany on January 27th of 1943. The other item uh, that was significant were all the letters that my dad wrote to my mother while he was stationed in England before he was shot down. And he was really candid in these letters. He talked about what bombing missions were like, what life was like on the air base, what life was like in England and London at the time, escapades of him and his crew. And reading those letters was absolutely fascinating. And I became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew, and it became my passion. I started reading book after book about the air war over Europe. I went on the internet and spent countless hours doing research, downloading declassified military documents. I went on a quest to find relatives of all the, uh, my dad's crew members to see what they could provide for me, letters, articles, pictures. I started going to World War II reunions and listening to veterans tell their stories. And finally, three years into my research, I came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so compelling uh, and so unique that it needed to be told. So I wrote, decided to write a book. From the time I started my research to the time the book was published was four and a half years. And to publish the book, I did something that was rather unique. I formed my own publishing company called Seabreeze Publishing, LLC, which is the name of the street that I live on in Seal Beach, California. And then I contracted with independent professionals for all the associated services, such as editing the book, cover design, interior layout. Uh, the printer that I used to print the hardcover book is located in Michigan, and then the fulfillment house that stores all the hardcover books and distribu distri distributes them is in Indiana. Uh, the first half of the book uh, builds up to the day that my, my dad's plane was shot down, and then the second half of the book is all about what happens afterwards. And it's completely based on first-hand testimony by the people who were involved in the events that took place. And it's just not about my dad either, but it's about each member of his crew and what happened to them. And also about all the courageous Belgian people that risked their lives trying to help them. But I probably wouldn't have written the book if it wasn't for two Belgian gentlemen. On the left here, you see my dad with his bomber jacket on with uh, Dr. Paul Delahaye. That picture was taken in uh, 1994 at the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium of my dad's plane being shot down. And then on the right-hand side, you see a picture of me with Jacques Lalo. That was taken 20, 20 years later. 
at the 70th anniversary uh, of the liberation of Belgium. During the war, these two men were young boys and they were greatly affected by it. They saw firsthand atrocities committed against their family and friends. And later on in life, they became local historians and they interviewed Belgian people and members of the Belgium underground about events that took place involving, involving my dad and his crew. And they documented their testimony. And they gave me unbelievably detailed information that would have been lost forever. So I owe them a huge debt. Initially, my dad didn't go into the Air Force as a result of the first peacetime draft uh, implemented by Franklin Roosevelt in September of 1940. My dad enlisted in the Army in April of 1942, excuse me, 1941. And uh, he was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. And at the time uh, when World War II first started, the US military was woefully weak. They ranked 18th in the world in military strength behind Romania. They were also very ill-equipped, as you can tell by the World War I uh, uniform that my dad has on here. A few months later, in July, uh, he married Ruth Hempel at First Lutheran Church in Pasadena, California. My mother was born and raised in, in, in Pasadena. It was shortly after she graduated from UCLA where she was a classmate of the legendary Jackie Robinson. I was also born and raised in Pasadena. I also went to uh, college at UCLA. And when I was there, Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was one, was one of my classmates. A few months later, on December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in infamy, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the United States was at war. While my mother was very concerned, uh, very fearful, the future was very uncertain. So at Christmas time, she decided to go up to Washington to visit my dad. And nine months later, Susan Ruth was born. Well, at the time, my dad was concerned how he was gonna provide for his new family. as a new wife, a baby on the way, and he didn't think he could do that very well on a private's pay in the army. So he decided to volunteer for the Air Force where he could make more money especially if he made it through uh, flight pilot training and became an officer. So in June of uh, 42, he went, in, uh, went through pre-flight training in Santa Ana, California, and then he went through the various phases of pilot training. This slide is kind of busy, but the, the, uh, the first three blocks here are kind of the main stages of pilot training. Uh, first was primary training, and if you made it through primary, then you went on to uh, basic pilot training. And pilot training was tough, uh, not only physically, but also mentally. Had, they had to pass and go a lot of college courses like uh, mathematics, physics, uh, meteorology, uh, aerodynamics. 40% of the cadets that started pilot training didn't make it through. They ended up be becoming navigators or bombardiers or, or gunners. After, after basic uh, pilot training, going into advanced training, they separated the pilots out. Uh, they either went into single engine planes or fighters or two engine planes, which resulted, ended up in uh, bombers or transports. Uh, typically, the shorter pilots went into fighters because of the cramped conditions in the cockpit. My dad was six foot three, so he went into twin engine planes. But personally, I also think it depended on a, a pilot's personality. To me, the fighter pilots tended to be pretty cocky, have big egos, be risk takers, pretty uh, individualistic, whereas the bomber pilots tended to be a little more level-headed and team players. Here you see my dad in uh, primary training in Santa Ana, California. This was a big day in his life because it was the first time he soloed. And if you notice, he's wearing his goggles on his helmet, and you could not wear your goggles on your helmet until you had soloed. Also, uh, he, he's smoking a cigarette there. I think everyone smoked uh, back during the war. These are the three different planes that he flew in pilot training. Up top in the primary through a Stearman bi biplane. Then in basic training, in the middle picture, a multivalent uh, single wing plane. And then in advanced training, he flew a Curtis Wright uh, twin engine AT-9. He graduated from pilot training in April of 1943 where he earned, learned his, earned his uh, pilot's wings and his commission as a second lieutenant. Uh, I'm wearing his graduation ring uh, today. And then he went on to uh, transitional crew training where he learned how to fly a four-engine B-17 bomber. 
From there, he went to operational training where the various members of the crew came together and they learned to operate as a team. And then once deemed ready, they were assigned overseas to the European Theater of Operations. My dad and his crew reported to the 306 bomb group on October 21st of 1943. This is what the base looked like back then. And the countryside around the, where the base was looks exactly the same <laughs> as what it did back then. Uh, there's a nice little museum there. Uh, my wife and I have visited there uh, several times. The latest was just in uh, August, where I organized a, a five-day tour for 21 members of the 306 Bomb Group Association uh, to visit the area for, to celebrate the 80th anniversary of the 306 uh, arriving in England. This is the insignia of the 306. Uh, in the 8th Air Force, there were three air divisions. The first air division was signified uh, by a triangle. And then there were four combat wings within each air division. The 306 was in the 40th combat wing, which was signified by the yellow. And then every bomb group had a letter designation for the 306, it was H. So the triangle H uh, represented the 306. Not only was the 306 the first bomb group to hit a target in Germany, but they were the longest serving bomb group in the 8th Air Force. They arrived in September of 1942, and they didn't uh, go back home until December of 1946. They stayed on after the war, involved in the Casey Jones Project, which was the aerial photo mapping of Western Europe and Northern Africa. Probably many of you have seen the 1949 movie, 12 O'Clock High, starring Gregory Peck. Well, that, was a, that story is based on a, tr a true story. That movie was based on a true story about the 306 bomb group. Uh, the fictitious bomb group in the movie, the 918th, was derived by multiplying the 306 by three. Another distinction of the 306 bomb group is that their flight surgeon, Dr. Thurman Schuler, was responsible for convincing 8th Bomber Command General Ira Aker to implement a mission limit in April of 1943. Up until that time, there was no mission limits, and the morale of these combat crews were just in the tank because they knew they would never make it home. They'd either be killed or shot down and become prisoners of war. Uh, so Schuler suggested a mission limit of 20. Uh, Aker set it at 25. But at least they had some hope of making it home in a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, in January of 44, when Jimmy Doolittle took over the 8th, he eventually raised the mission limit to 30 and then to 35. Uh, every bomb group had four bomb squadrons. These are the four in the uh, 306. Some of the left corner, you have the clay pigeons. Uh, they were named that by a Saturday Evening Post journalist because of the horrific losses that they took. That bomb squadron took more losses than any other bomb squadron in the 8th Air Force. Then going across, you have the uh, Eager Beavers, then down to the left, the Grim Reapers, and then my dad's squadron, the 369th Fight and Biting. I always like to point out the ground crews. Um, the combat crews got all the glory and all the recognition, but it was these ground crews that kept these planes flying. When these bombers would come back after missions, uh, the ground crews would stay up all night long, usually in very inclement weather, uh, repairing battle damage, uh, doing maintenance on the plane, changing out engines, t tires, what have you. And they took great pride in these planes, and they really considered these planes their planes, and they just loaned them out to the combat crews occasionally to fly missions. So they're really the unsung heroes. Here you see my dad's crew. Uh, B-17 had a 10-man crew, at least at the beginning of the war. Later on in the war, they uh, Went to, reduced it to a nine-man crew. But you have the four officers here in front. This is my dad. He was the first pilot and as such the commander of the plane and the crew. And going across you have the co-pilot, the navigator, and the bombardier. And then six enlisted men who were mainly gunners. Five of these men came home, but five of them did not. Uh, this is not the Susan Ruth. That's just a B-17 that they took their picture, a crew picture in front of when they arrived in England. Uh, you'll notice the, the nose art on the plane. I love the nose art. Uh, it's interesting that the Air Force was the only entity that allowed their pl planes to be painted. The Marines didn't, the Navy didn't, nor did other countries. 
But the Air Force thought it could help the morale of these young guys if they could personalize their planes. And they're very creative in what they named and painted on their pl planes. You know, many times it was a cartoon character, but more often than not, it was a scantily clad or, or nude woman. Was, after all, these guys were in their you know, late teens and early 20s and were very young men. Uh, the, the 306 flew uh, B-17s, actually the first and third division in the 8th Air Force, both flew B-17s in the second Air Division flew B-24 Liberators. Uh, B-17 was nicknamed uh, the Flying Fortress by a Seattle reporter because of all the armament that they had on the plane. They had 12 to 13 50 caliber machine guns so that they could put out a tremendous amount of firepower. Plus they could take a tremendous amount of battle damage as well as keep flying. Uh, every plane uh, had, was identified by tail markings. Again, you see the Triangle H, the 306 bomb group and then every plane had identification uh, specific serial number, which was supplied by the manufacturer. The Boeing company uh, designed uh, and produced 60% of the B-17s, but Lockheed Vega and the Douglas Aircraft Company each produced 20% as well. Uh, Eighth Air Force fl 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 flew uh, three different models of B-17s. The first was the E model, but they only uh, manufactured about 500 of them, so they were quickly phased out by the F model. And then in the fall of 1943, it started being replaced by the G model, really the <coughs> definitive uh, B-17. And you can always tell the G model by the chin turret under, under the nose. Here you see the crew positions on the plane. Uh, it was pretty much the same as a B-24. Uh, here in the plexiglass nose, again, this is a G model with a chin turret. You had the bombardier, the navigator, two pilots, the flight engineer, the bomb bay, radio operator, ball turret gunner, two waist gunners, and then the tail gunner. Uh, the bombs hung up on racks in the bomb bay, and it was it's really narrow in there. For, for, for those of you who have never been in a B-17 before, it's really cramped. Uh, this boy is only eight years old, and that catwalk is only eight inches wide, so it's very tight. And occasionally, these bombs would get hung up on the racks during a bomb run, which would require one of the crewmen to either take a wrench and knock it loose or kick it loose with his foot. And when those bomb bay doors are open, they're lo you're looking five miles straight down to the ground, so that took a little courage, or a lot of courage, to do that. Here you see the crew positions a little more clearly. Uh, this is the F model with no chin turret. Uh, there's the bombardier. His main job is to drop the bombs uh, accurately. But in the G model, he would man the chin turret uh, when they were under attack by enemy fighters. Then you had the navigator who needed to know where they were and where they were headed. And then if they were under attack, he manned the cheek guns that were on each side of the nose. Yes, sir. Yes, yes they were. The other two officers are the pilots. We had the first pilot in the left seat, like my dad, and then the co-pilot in the right seat. And you needed two pilots to fly these planes, not just because if one was injured or killed, you had another guy that could do the job. But it was very uh, stressful, both physically and mentally, to fly these planes. Back then, it took muscle to, to fly these planes. And it was very tiring, because these missions took six to 10 hours in length. And they had to stay alert at all times because they flew in tight formation. So if they you know, lost their, their uh, composure a little bit or didn't stay alert, they could clip a wing on the plane next to them or run into the plane in front of them and go down. Also, they had to continually fight the turbul air turbulence. Uh, you have the normal weather turbulence, which when I came in yesterday, it was really bumpy. Uh, but they also had the turbulence from all those bombers being in such close proximity to one another. So the wake turbulence and the prop wash would just churn the air up. So they had to really, you know, they, strenuous work flying these planes. And then behind the uh, pilots, you had the flight engineer who manned the, the top turret under attack. He was called the crew chief and he was an onboard mechanic and knew how everything worked. And he helped monitor the uh, control panel and the instruments in the cockpit. In a B-17, there were over 150 different gauges and dials and toggles and switches. And the flight engineer would peer over the pilot's shoulders to help uh, monitor engine performance and fuel, fuel consumption. 
And then behind the bomb bay, you had the radio operator. He had the most comfortable position on the plane. He had a little roomy compartment, relatively, and had a chair to sit at, and then the most cramped position on the plane, the ball turret gunner. Again, these missions were six to 10 hours, and he's in that fetal position you know, for hours on end, so that was a very uncomfortable spot to be. A lot of people uh, have the misunderstanding that the ball turret was the most dangerous position on the plane, but actually, it was the safest. And then uh, above the ball, you have the two waste gunners. That was the most exposed positions on the plane. And then the kill gunner, which was another cramped position. My dad flew his first mission on October, uh, November 3rd of 1943, a mission to Wilhelmshaven, Germany. It was the first time the 8th Air Force put up over 500 bombers on a mission. And flying combat missions was brutal and extremely dangerous. Uh, the 8th Air Force lost 26,000 men. That's more than the entire Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific. They lost another 28,000 men who became POWs after their planes were knocked out of the sky by either enemy fighters or air, anti-aircraft fire. And it was dangerous from the time these guys took off until the time they landed. Uh, at the peak, there were 40 bomb groups uh, located in an area of England called East, Ang oops, East Anglia, which was about the size of Vermont. And these bases are only located about five to 10 miles apart. So on the day of a mission, you could have hundreds of planes all taken off at the same time. And back then there was no air traffic control. There was no radar. Uh, it was all based on visual sight. And usually the, you know, that area of England was socked in and they couldn't see anything until they got above the cloud layer. So mid-air collisions were not uncommon. Then they had to form up. Individual planes formed up into three plane elements. Elements formed up into bomb squadrons. Bomb squadrons formed up into bomb groups. Bomb groups formed up into combat wings. Combat wings formed up into air divisions. And all it took an hour to two hours before they could even begin their uh, mission across the English Channel. And then they had to deal with the elements. These planes weren't pressurized, so above 10,000 feet they had to go on oxygen or after a couple minutes, they had passed out and could die from anoxia. It also was extremely cold at the altitude that they were flying. It was minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero. So frostbite was a huge problem. There were many airmen that were hospitalized for lengthy periods of time with serious frostbite injuries. One of my dad's uh, waist gunners, John Pindrock, was in the hospital for two and a half months because of frostbite injuries. Uh, here you see a uh, waste gunner with his combat uniform on. Actually, he's standing in front of a V-24 there, but his, his still helmet, his goggles, his oxygen mask, the flak jacket. That was like an apron with metal plates in the front and back to help protect him. Then his uh, fleece lined jacket and pants, thermal gloves and boots. And then the strap here is his uh, parachute harness. It was so cramped in the plane that they didn't wear their parachutes uh, on. Uh, it's more cramped in a B-17 than it is in a submarine. So if they uh, needed to bail out, they had to have their wits about them to find their parachute to begin with and then hook it on, or clip it on hooks on the back of the harness and then jump out of the plane. Oh, B-29, yeah. Thank you for your service, sir. Again, you'll see a creative nose art here. The next thing they had to worry about was enemy fighters. Um, the Germans had uh, radar stations set up along the coast of continental Europe so they knew when these bomber formations were coming and they'd send up their Air Force, Air Force to Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe to intercept them. Here you see Waste Gunner again firing his 50, 50 caliber machine gun, his flak jacket on, all these spent cartridges, cartridges on the bottom of the plane. That's like stepping on ball bearings or marbles. Uh, the ammunition came in belts of uh, 27 feet. So if he fired the whole belt, he said he fired the whole nine yards. And that's where that expression came from. At, at the beginning of the, the air war in, uh, out of England, it was 8th Bomber Command's belief that these heavily armed bombers flying in tight formations of hundreds of bombers could defend themselves from the Luftwaffe. They didn't need any ice uh, fighter support. And they flew in what was called a combat box formation. 
Here you see the combat box of a combat wing. And then within the box of the wing, you have three boxes representing bomb groups. And then within each bo box of the bomb group, you have three boxes representing bomb squadrons. So the theory was that all that interlacing firepower could ward off the, uh, the German Luftwaffe. But unfortunately, that was not the case. Uh, during the early years of the war in 42 and 43, the 8th Air Force took devastating losses. Uh, even though they implemented that mission limit of 25 in the spring of 43, it was statistically impossible to complete 25 missions. In 1943, the average number of missions flown before being shot down was six. And even when they did give them fighter support to begin with, the fighters didn't have the fuel capacity to escort the bombers all the way into Germany and back. They could get across the channel and into France, but then they'd, have to, they'd run low on fuel and they'd have to head back to their bases. Well, Luftwaffe would just wait until they did that, and then they'd come and attack the, uh, the bomber formations. Here you see the uh, um, back, combat box formation a little more from the, from the, from the side, or from the, so from the top and then from the side. It was a three-dimensional formation with a lead group, a high group, and a low group. The, the losses uh, culminated in the fall of 1943 in what was, what was called Black Week, when over four missions, they lost 148 planes. That's almost 1,500 men. The worst day was uh, October 14th, what they referred to as Black Thursday, when they sent 291 B-17s to bomb the wall bearing factories at Schweinfurt, and 60 of them were shot down. Uh, of the 306 bomb group, 10 of the 15 planes that they put up were shot down. Well, the 8th Air Force was in shock after that. Um, there was absolutely no way they could uh, sustain those types of losses, and they seriously considered discontinuing daylight bombing. It wasn't until the end of December when external fuel tanks were added to the P-47 Thunderbolts and the introduction of the P-51 Mustang that they finally had fighter escorts that could take them deep into Germany and escort them all the way back uh, to their bases. The P uh, Mustangs were particularly uh, effective. Uh, they basically decimated the, the Luftwaffe. By the time D-Day rolled around on June 6 of uh, 44, the Luftwaffe was just a shell of itself, and the Allies had air su supremacy. The next thing they had to deal with was an aircraft fire. This is a flak gun. Flak was an abbreviation for the German word for aircraft defense cannon. And these were deadly weapons. They fired 20 shells a minute, and they were calibrated to explode at the same altitude that these bombers were flying. And these shells were filled with all different shapes and sizes of razor-sharp metal that would burst out hundreds of feet when they exploded and could easily penetrate the thin aluminum skin of these bombers. It was so skin you could take a screwdriver and just poke it right through it. Uh, from a distance, these looked like little innocent black puffs. But as they got closer, those puffs got bigger and the explosions got louder. And once you were in that killing field, uh, explosions near the plane would just violently rock the ship. My dad said even though it was so cold at that altitude, he would just be sweating profusely, and his clothes would be dripping wet with the adrenaline running through his body. If a shell hit a bomber directly, it would basically just, just, just disintegrate and disappear. Or if it knocked off a wing, that plane would just drop to the ground like a stone. When they neared the target, they reached a predetermined point called the IP, the initial point where they started their bomb run. And at that time, the pilot gave control over the plane to the bombardier who would fly the plane to the Norden bomb site, which we have one on display in the uh, hospitality room. And at the time, these were revolutionary devices. They were an analog computer that could calculate various factors, such as the, the speed of the plane, the altitude of the plane, wind speed, wind direction, so they could accurately drop the bombs. And they were also highly secretive. Uh, the bombardiers had to take an oath that they'd defend this with their life. Little did the U.S. know at the time, though, that the Germans had a spy in the Norden bomb factory, Hermann Lang, and they knew everything about the Norden bomb site. Hermann Lang was eventually uh, arrested and spent 19 years in, in prison. Here you see the bombardier looking through the cross uh, hairs of the bomb site. Later on in the war, they removed the bombardier from the, the planes, and they had one of the gunners called a toggler that would uh, release the bombs. 
But once the bombs were released, they'd yell, bombs away, and that would signal the first pilot to take control of the plane. And then he would make a huge, big turn to get the hell out of there and go to another pre-designated point called a rally point, where the bombers that made it through the bomb run would try to form up again and then head back to their bases in England, where once again they would have to face enemy fighters. And then once they did reach England, there was still a number of dangers they had to face. Um, it could be, the weather could be socked in, they couldn't even find their bases, they could be uh, running out of fuel, you could have injured or uh, dead pilots on board, you have planes that sustain tremendous amount of battle damage, you have engines that uh, would, would be out, you had flight controls that would be shot out, landing gear that wouldn't come down, brakes that didn't work. So once again, you had airmen killed through crashes trying to get back to their bases. It was on a bombing mission to Frankfurt on February 8th of 1944, where the Susan Ruth dropped its bombs successfully. But the Bombay doors got hit by flak and they couldn't get them back up. And as a result, that caused a drag on the plane. They started losing airspeed and they fell behind the bomber formation heading back to England. And they were singled out by two German Focke-Wulf 190 fighters, like wolves or lions on prey. They came in for the kill in the ensuing air battle, the Susan Ruth was shot down. Two of the crew members were killed in the plane. The other eight were able to bail out successfully. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the book goes into detail about what happened to each of those guys. I don't have enough time to talk about each of them today. Um, but some of them ended, ended tragically, uh, some ended happily. But both those Focke-Wulf fighters were shot down at the same time. One was piloted by Siegfried Merrick, and he, his plane crashed, and he was killed in the plane. And the other was, one was piloted by uh, Hans Berger, who was able to bail out, and he made it through the war. While I was doing my research, one day my wife said, well, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot your dad down? And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, she's naive. She has no idea what she's talking about. That would be impossible. But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do, and I found Hans Berger. And fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war, so he speaks perfect English. And he gave me some wonderful insight that's in the book about what it was like to go up against all those U.S. bombers and fighters. After my dad came down, uh, or when my, after my dad bailed out, he came down on these trees right at the French-Belgium border. And his parachute got hung up at the branches and he couldn't get down. He was dangling 20 feet off the ground. But fortunately for him, a couple of young Belgian men, Henri Franken and Raymond Durvin, came to his rescue before the Germans could get to him. Uh, this is the tree that they helped him down, and that is a picture of uh, Henri Franken. Uh, I, there's over 200 time period photos uh, in the print books. You can visualize everything that you're reading about. Many of them were sent to my dad's helpers, like these pictures here. And then I also got a lot from Jacques Vallot and Paul Delahaye. Uh, this occurred early in the afternoon. So they told him to stay put and to hide because they thought it was too dangerous to move him in daylight with German patrols combing the area. Uh, but that night they came back and got him and they took him to the Dervan farmhouse. That house is still there today. That house is in Belgium, but those trees are in France. So it's right on the border. Uh, they thought it was too dangerous for him to spend uh, uh, more than one night there with those German patrols still in the area. So the next night, a Belgium customs officer, Paul Tilcan, uh, came to, on, with a tandem bicycle to take him to a safer location. And on their journey, uh, they, well, they started out. It was the middle of the night. It was raining, uh, pitch dark. Uh, and they started pelling up. The, going to a, a different location. And my dad could only pedal with one leg because he had shrapnel wounds in his other leg. And they came to a hill and they couldn't pedal it up the hill anymore. So they started walking the bike up the hill. And when they got to the top, uh, there was this cabaret or cafe. The lights were on, people were laughing and talking loudly. Music was playing. And out walks two uh, German officers with these young, two young French girls. One of them comes up to my dad, puts his arm around him, and asks for a light for a cigarette. Well, my dad's petrified. He can't speak German. Uh, he didn't know French at that time. But fortunately, Paul you know, could, and he knew what they wanted, and he lit the cigarette. 
and they let them go on their, their way. Uh, my dad said these guys were too drunk and too interested in these young girls to pay much attention to a couple of guys pushing a bike up in the rain in the middle of the night. And this is uh, what that uh, little cabaret looked like in 1994. That building's still there. And then after that, my dad was moved from place to place to place. How long he stayed in any given lo location depended on how brave the Belgian people were that lived there and how dangerous the Belgium underground thought it was for him to stay there. He might spend one night, he might spend six weeks. And these are a few of my dad's helpers. He had many more than, than this. Um, obviously, this is my dad here on the right. They put a beret on him to help him blend in with, with the locals. But as I mentioned, my dad was 6'3", so he was quite a bit taller uh, than the local Belgian people. And the people who hit my dad, or any down dareman for that matter, were unbelievably brave people. They risked not only their lives, but the lives of their family and friends because of the German secret police, the Gestapo found out about it. They'd be arrested, tortured, and either shot or sent to a concentration camp. And some of the people who helped my dad and other members of his, of his crew did meet that fate. Uh, here, see my dad with two women who he stayed with for uh, lengthy periods of time on the list is Ghislaine Bayou. It was with her and her father, that, uh, her husband, uh, that my dad wrote his diary. And then on the right is Jeanette Gadin. Uh, her husband was actually a captain in the French army who was uh, captured in 1940 when Germany first invaded the Lowlands and he spent the remainder of the war as a, as a POW. It was very st you know, strenuous for, for my dad to, uh, to hide. Uh, you know, to begin with, he's, he's playing the attack, it's on fire, he has to bail out, he comes down in a foreign country, he has no idea where he is doesn't know what hap happened to his buddies on the crew, can't communi communicate with the U.S. military. He's being helped by complete strangers who can't you know, speak each other's language. He had a little French-English dictionary in his escape kit that he could refer to. And in any of these people might be collaborators and turn them over to the Gestapo. And he had several close calls that are described in the book about almost being discovered. One was at the, the Bayou House uh, in Charleroi and uh, I've been in this house. You, one evening, there was a loud pounding on the door, and uh, Maurice told my dad to get up on the roof, and then he'd come get him uh, when it was clear after the Germans had left. Unfortunately, you can't see it from this picture, but uh, there's an attic in this roof, and there's a little tiny window. It's only like about this big that my dad had to squeeze through. And then the pitch on that roof is really steep. It's a tile roof. And he stayed up there the whole night. Maurice never did come get him because the Germans didn't leave the area. Finally, my dad got tired of hiding. Um, word came that the Allies had landed at Normandy on D-Day, June 6th. So he decided to get back in the fight. Unlike most airmen, uh, my dad had that year's training in the, in the army, in the infantry, so he knew how to fight on the ground. So he decided to, to join the French resistance. His helpers tried to talk him out of it because it was pretty darn dangerous. He could be killed uh, fighting the Germans, or if he was captured, he'd be shot on the spot as a terrorist. But uh, he convinced one of his helpers Amy Cools, uh, she accompanied him on, they rode bicycles across the border into France, and he met up with a local unit of the French uh, resistance called the Mackey. Uh, this was not his group, to give you an idea of what they uh, kind of looked like. The Mackey were a small independent ragtag guerrilla groups that uh, harassed the Germans. They would attack convoys, disrupt communications, sabotage railroad lines, assassinate German officers. And they received their uh, instructions from the British over the B BBC through coded messages. And they were also supplied by airdrops from, from the British. And my dad said the information that they gave them was unbelievably accurate. If they said a German convoy was coming down this road on this day at this time, sure enough, there they were. And that was a result of the British cracking, cracking the uh, German Enigma code and knowing everything that they were up to. This is the farmhouse that they stayed in in Wallers, France. Uh, that farmhouse is still there today. Um, there's my dad in, standing in front of it. Uh, that picture was taken in 1994. 
Uh, my dad stayed up here in this tower where you see these uh, two windows. One uh, early morning he was shaving, uh, just had his skivvies on, uh, shaving cream on his face. He looked out the windows and a German patrol was coming up the, the uh, road. So he uh, jumped out the back of the uh, farmhouse and hightailed it into the, the woods to avoid being captured. And there's several uh, encounters uh, that the Mackey had with the uh, German convoys that are pretty thrilling that are de described in the book. Here's my dad fighting with uh, the Mackey. Who took this picture and how it, ever got, how it ever got back to my dad, I'll never know. But that was taken in 1944 with my dad jumping out of that Jeep. Finally, seven months after he bailed out, word came that there were U.S. troops in a nearby village of Trelon, France. So he walked into the village, into the town square, went up to an army major. Actually, it was an element of Patton's Third Army, which had come up uh, through France after D-Day. He identified himself. They interrogated him to make sure he was who he said he was. And then he caught a ride on a convoy taking German prisoners to Paris. And then from Paris, he hopped on a transport back to England, where he sent a Western Union telegram to my mother saying, is that sweet little chin up, honey? Uh, fit as a fiddle, back at base, bank the money, because they had all that back pay coming from missing in seven months in, in, in action. Uh, Belgium is a wonderful little country. It's a unique country. It's really divided in two. The upper portion of Belgium is called Flanders, where they speak Dutch. And the lower portion of uh, Belgium it's called Wallonia, where they speak French. And uh, my dad and the plane and the guys that were able to bail out came out right around the French-Belgian border. Actually, my dad on the plane came down in Belgium, and the other guys that bailed out came down in France. But the resistance brought them over the border back into Belgium. And this is Charleroi, where the uh, Bayous and lived. And then uh, Trelon, where my dad was liberated in that farmhouse that the Mackey stayed at, was right over here. The Belgian people are wonderful people. To this day, they are still so thankful and so grateful for the Americans liberating them from four years of Nazi occupation and Nazi oppression. And they do a great job of educating the younger generations to remember as well. They built a number of uh, memorials uh, in the area to remember different events and on the anniversary of those events, they have uh, ceremonies, but the big ceremonies are all around September 2nd, when that area was liberated uh, from the Germans. This is a, the, a poster from the 70th anniversary. The, the celebrations last several days, and they're wonderful events. They erect these, erect these huge tents. Uh, this is just a portion of one that seat hundreds of people. And they have dances and band concerts and uh, lunches and dinners. And the local reenactors set up a US Army camp and have a, military vehicle parade and they're just so much fun uh, the helpers dress in period uh, uniforms and the local beer chimay just flows and everyone has a swell time uh, but they also have more serious uh, events as well this is a ceremony at Sendron which is right at the French Belgium border where the U.S. 9th Infant Infantry first crossed over the Wartraz River from France into Belgium to liberate the country. Now, all the villagers come out. Uh, the U.S. military is represented, Belgian military, French military. Uh, the local dignitaries make speeches. The U.S. ambassador to Belgium comes down with an entourage. Uh, and they're just wonderful events. Uh, again, you see sitting up in front are these young people, again, to emphasize the importance of the occasion. This is the memorial that uh, was built to my dad and his crew, to the Susan Ruth crew. Uh, Dr. Delahaye founded the Belgium American Foundation to honor and remember these events. Uh, that was erected in 1989. And like most uh, World War II veterans, my dad didn't talk a lot about the war until 1989. He and three other members of the crew that were still living at the time went over for the dedication of this memorial. And there he was reunited with all these Belgian people that hit him during the war, visited these locations where he was hidden, and they started talking about it. And then five years later, I made my first trip to Belgium with my parents, and I got to see all these things firsthand, and that's when it became personal for me. 
on the, there's two plaques that you can see on the bottom of the uh, memorial. They have the names of the crew, their positions on the crew, and then their, their ages at the time. Here you see my dad in 1989 at the, at the uh, dedication of the memorial. This is Dr. Delahaye here with the beard. This is my dad with a tie. This is Jeanette Yadin. Uh, she was in the picture I showed uh, you earlier. Uh, this is Nellie Tilcan. She was the husband of that Belgium customs officer, Paul Tilcan. A couple months after he helped my dad, he was arrested by the Gestapo. Uh, sent to prison, tortured, and just narrowly escaped being executed. But he died a few years later because of the beatings he took from the Gestapo. And then this is the other gentleman to help my dad down from the trees, Raymond Dervan. I've been to Belgium six times, and uh, I can't wait to go back again for the 80th anniversary in 2024. On two of those occasions, I continued on to Germany, to visit Hans Berger, that Luftwaffe pilot that shot down my dad's plane. And we've become friends. Uh, we visited him at his uh, apartment in Munich. Uh, here he is with his fighter jacket on. And you... uh, his Iron Cross. He shot down seven B-17s and one Spitfire. But he was shot down three times himself. Most all of his friends were, were, were killed in the war. And the only reason I think he really made it is that at the beginning of 1945, he was pulled out of combat uh, to test pilot the HE Hinkle 162 uh, single engine fighter that the Germans were trying to perfect, which they never did. But if he had stayed in the combat, he probably wouldn't be around. Why isn't my clicker working here? There we go. And then we went to the Hofbrau house to have a, have a cold one. A lot of people ask me, well, how can you be friends with this German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? But he was pretty much just like the US Airman. He was 19, 20 years old, fighting for his country, trying to do a job and trying to stay alive. He said it was unfortunate they had to be shooting at each other, but they were at war. And he said that we were not all evil Nazis. And also, the, World War II was the defining moment of my dad's life, without a doubt. At one point in time, my dad's life crossed paths with Hans, and so he was a part of my dad's story, a part of my dad's life. So uh, he'll be 99 years old next month. And it, interestingly enough, of all the people that are in the shot down story, he is the only one that's still living. Here you see me and my dad at the World War II Memorial. He wanted to go see it before he died. He was at a uh, reunion of the, uh, the uh, Air Force Escape and Evasion Society. It was right before the official dedication. And that was the last trip he ever took. He died three years later in 2007 at the age of 91. And all the World War II vets are in their late 90s or, you know, hitting, passing 100 these days. At the end of World War II, there were 16 million veterans. Today, there's one and a half percent of those great men still with us. There was no other event in history that affected more people than World War II. 60 million people died, millions more were wounded, millions more were left homeless and displaced. It changed the course of America and the world forever. And the brave young men who fought and died for freedom, without doubt, the greatest generation. And their sacrifice must never be forgotten. It's our duty to remember. Thank you. Thank you. I'll field some questions if anyone uh, has any. One thing I'll mention that after my dad got back to England, they sent him home to be a B-17 instructor because they had a rule that if you were shot down and helped by the underground that you could not go back into combat because they were worried if you went back in combat and were shot down a second time, captured by the Germans and tortured, that you'd give up the identity of the people that helped you the first time. There was only one exception to that rule, and that was Chuck Yeager, who personally met with General Eisenhower and talked him into going back into combat. Yes, sir. Did your dad get the little caterpillar? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a member of the Caterpillar Club. Yeah. So you're going to be around for the rest of the weekend? Uh, just to the end of the day. I have books outside if anyone wants to buy uh, one. They're 
$25 cash or a credit card. Yes? Another question about the Caterpillar phone. My father was shot down over in Yugoslavia, um, and he never did get it. He bailed um, and survived. But um, do you know who to write to? Do they award those posthumously? You know? That's a wonderful question. Um, I'm not sure, but come uh, get one of my business cards and send me an email and I'll look into that for you. Yeah, anyone that, yeah, that yeah. Bailed, bailed out. Yeah. 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 So, so um, there's a book I read recently, I think it was called The Higher Honor. A Higher Call. Higher Call. In, uh, is that the same? Hans that was German? No, that was Franz Stigler. Franz. Yeah. yeah. This is Hans Berger. Okay. I can't tell you how excited I was when I found him. Yeah. And for the book, I just interviewed him uh, over the phone and through email. And one point he goes, Steve, you're asking me all, I bombarded him with questions. And he goes, Steve, you're asking me all these personal questions. And you know, I've, you've never even met, but uh, I, built up his trust, and as I said, we, we became friends. One other thing I'll mention is that when my, my dad was missing in action, my other sister was born, because he, he, he didn't know whether he had a boy or a girl until he got back to his base in England. And it's kind of funny that in all the letters that he wrote to my mother while he was stationed in England, he always referred to the unborn baby as Steve or Stevie, but it turned out to be Nancy. But that was really tough on my mom, you know, having these two little small girls and never knowing if she, you know, not for over seven months, not knowing if she'd ever see her husband again. Did he ever express an opinion on the film 12 O'Clock High or other, other war movies? No, I, I don't recall. Um, no, he was very proud of his service though. My dad was, he, my, my, Sisters and I, we always we compared him to John Wayne. He was, you know, a big guy, a rugged guy, no nonsense guy, disciplinarian, but a very loving father. I did go to see uh, Saving Private Ryan with my dad and two of my sons, and uh, that was an emotional experience walking to the th at that theater. Oh, that picture is is it the tallest one with the leather coat? This one here? Was that him, your dad? Yeah, that's my dad's crew. So where, where's your dad? This, this is my dad here. Oh, okay. Yeah, like I say, five of these men came home, but five of them did not. Thank you. Well, again, oh, yes, sir. Your, your wing formation diagram, at the bottom it showed, uh, I think it showed 54 aircraft. In, in the wing, and I was just wondering, you know, in, in the 15th, at least in my dad's bomb group, I think they flew over with 60 B-24s, and they were lucky if they could get, you know, they were lucky if they could get 35 up for a mission. So that would be, you know, 105 aircraft between the three groups, you know, that would be a wing in the 15th. How, how, many, how many B-17s could your dad's group get up on a, you know, full effort type mission? Well, it depended on whether it was in the beginning of the air war, uh, like in 42 or 43, that they didn't get up that many. But then, in, I mean, 42 or 43, but in 44 and 45, they did. Uh, on December 24th of 1944, the Eighth Air Force put up 2,000 bombers to hit targets around Berlin. Can you imagine that? 2,000 bombers and 1,000 fighters. So, uh, but those formations, they changed during the war too. Sometimes the squadrons, there were 12 planes, sometimes 18, uh, they, they, they varied. 2,000 planes going, and then they're doing the same thing in the Pacific over the sand, almost the same time. Yeah, yeah there are bombers dropping their bombs in Germany when other, Planes were hadn't even taken off from England yet. Did I see a hand over there? Yes, sir. Make a statement at the end of World War II, 
the end point was the defeat of a totalitarian ideology and the consequences that, that had succeeded, we would be in an entirely different perspective of who we are and what we should be. I guess in the World War II memorial, there is what indicated 200,000 uh, casualties, and they stood the line and gave their lives for the freedom that we experienced. And the reason for this reunion here is a commemoration and remembrance of all of those people who stood there and gave their lives in the freedom of our country. Amen. If If we could only get the younger generations to appreciate that fact. You know, the, that's why I said the Belgian people or the, uh, the people that I know in the Netherlands or in northern France or even England, you know, the, those occupied countries, they know what it was like to lose your freedom for four years. So that's why they cherish it and that's why they remember it. You know, we've never experienced that in the United States. People just take their freedoms for granted. But as things are coming, those freedoms can be, it's obvious and you can see they can be taken away. It's stated in the Declaration of Independence. Yep. And the world took notice of that. I'd like to make an observation of that system in, in there. And uh, the war, war was one as bad as it was, and as many people there, they were stunned with people from 18-year-olds uh, to 25, won the war. It wasn't them generals and all that, wasn't it? Yeah. The 15, I mean, 25-year-old men, but were. Yeah, some of them were boys, really. No, I went in when I was barely 18. Oh, my dad was an old man, he was 28. <laughs> saying, I think out of rural America, those 18-year-old boys, and some of them drafted out of high school and came back with the GED, whatever, to finish their high school. And their progression of their lives has made this country great of what it is up to this point. And they are the ones who stood there and many of their lives were taken from them, and the mothers and fathers then wept over the loss of their loved ones. Yeah, one of a, a poignant part of my book, there's a lot of excerpts from letters in my book from crew members and uh, relatives of crew members. And the, the exchange of letters between the wives and mothers and sweethearts of the crew after these guys were shot down are very moving. Uh, I had a comment about something you said about, you know, the precision bombing and all. And then I'm thinking, even now, when, when we hear that somebody's jumping on to somebody in, in, or like, like what's happening in the Ukraine and all, then people say, well, yeah, but look, look, they shot, they hit that church or that hospital or whatever. And during World War II, France and England and maybe uh, uh, probably Italy too, but anyway, uh, you can do very much precision bombing when the people in England and in France for sure were being, I don't care if you were in a hospital or a church or wherever you were, if they, the enemy bombed, they did not worry about precision bombing. They killed so many people. How many did you mention? How many million was it? 60 million. 60 million. Yeah. <laughs> did, uh, did, but you think you said five of this crew died and five survived. Were they prisoners of war or did they also make their way out of Belgium? All of the. 
to find out the details, you need to read the book. <laughs> but but some, of them, some, of them, some of them did become uh, POWs, some evaded, some were killed. Yeah, some, some you know, kind of, anything that could happen to a bomber crew happened to my dad's crew. I have a question about the um, photograph that you showed of the plane going down. Was that the actual photograph? No, no, no. I was just curious. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll just reinforce something that you said. The, I, I don't know if everybody understands that when, when the Air Force sent out the, the, the letters to inform the families that, that their uh, family members were missing in action, they sent a, a list of the crew with their next of kin so that the families could communicate. Because sometimes one family member would find out what, what was going on. And, and it was just astonishingly informal. So, but, and the Air Force understood that, that they needed to rely on that network. So um, everybody had everybody's uh, address and they, would, and they sent those letters around. And any, uh, the first person who, who heard something would communicate with everybody else. And, that, and that's how they knew. So you know, they, when, when somebody actually returned, um, and would, like, I'm sure when your father returned, it was a good month before before a telegram was even sent uh, to uh, to the family to tell them, hey, they're still alive or, or, or they're safe. Meanwhile, your father probably sent a letter home, and somebody sent a letter, sent letters out to to everybody and, and told them what happened. And that, to me, that's a, an interesting aspect of the war. You, you could rely on the government; you relied on yourself, which is <laughs> still true. <laughs> Very good point. Well, I'll reinforce one other th point that you made, Steve, that it was a defining moment for your father and for a million of other servicemen. <clears throat> My father was stopped by a motorcycle cop in Oklahoma City in five o'clock traffic. He had gone over the center line and this young Barney Fife informed him how he was endangering his life and the life of others and he had gone and broken this law and that law and whatever my dad listened to all he wanted and he said boy I have lived through a world oppression and a second world war and I've listened to you all I'm gonna you're either gonna give me a ticket or turn me loose in the next 60 seconds and I don't care which <laughs> Did he pay the no the guy in front of what he'd done dad said you're absolutely right you got 30 seconds <laughs> Then write a ticket. <laughs> Dad said, have a good day, oh, sir. <laughs> well, we're going to have a birthday celebration and some cake in the hospitality room at about uh, between 1 and 1.30, and then we'll be back here at 2 o'clock for another presentation. Thanks again.